How are we doing? There we go. Very good. All right, so my name is Brent, and I am with Red Hat. We produce a podcast called Command Line Heroes, and it is for open source developers, IT architects, and sysadmins. So I want you to applaud if you have heard of our show. All right, a couple people. Well, today we are going to try something brand new. We have never done this before. We are going to do a live episode for you. Uh, call it our beta, or <laughs> probably more like our alpha release, and uh, we want your feedback. So later today, we are going to be at one of the conversation corners, right? So at three o'clock, we're gonna be at the conversation corner, and we want you to, after the show, come by and give us your thoughts, all right? So we want to know what you thought of the show. And uh, you can have your caricature drawn, and we have Command Line Heroes socks to give away. So come by and get your socks. Yeah, socks, right? They're great. All right, so for those who haven't heard the podcast, uh, Command Line Heroes tells the epic stories of people who transform technology from the command line up. These are stories about how we got here, like the OS wars, the agile revolution, containers, the cloud, uh, committing code, and so much more. And this is our third season, and it's all about programming languages. Everything from Python to BASIC to Perl to JavaScript to COBOL and Go and C. And uh, our most popular episode this season, can you guess what it was? COBOL. <laughs> I'm just kidding. It wasn't COBOL. Uh, <laughs> it was JavaScript. So, uh, by applause, how many of you uh, work with JavaScript? I want you to cheer, yeah? All right, pretty good. Uh, but how much do you really know about JavaScript? So we're gonna test your knowledge, all right? We're gonna test your knowledge, and we are gonna do a little pop quiz up on the screen. Uh, so for each question, I want you to applaud whichever you think is the right answer. All right, so here's our first question. The first release of JavaScript was created in how many days? Was it eight days? Nobody? Okay. Was it 10 days? Okay. How about 22 days? All right. You'll find out the answer later. Next question. So how many estimated JavaScript developers are there in the world today? What do you think? Three million? Really? Anybody? All right. 22.8 million? All right, some people think so. How about 10.7 million? Hmm. All right, last question. The object-oriented underlying pattern in JavaScript was taken from which programming language? Was it Modula 2? <laughs> One person <laughs> thinks that. Cool. Uh, Algol or Pascal? A couple people, okay. Cool. All right, so. Uh, the answers to all these questions are about to be revealed in the show, so pay attention. Uh, we're about to go deep into the language that most of you engage with every day. So presenting a live performance of Command Line Heroes 3, or Season 3, Episode 3, Creating JavaScript. So I mentioned this before, but we are going to be recording this episode right here, right now. So actually our sound engineer, Sean Cole over here, is going to be recording the episode and he needs your help. So we want to hear all of you in the episode. 
And when we need you to applaud, Sean is going to do this. There you go. Let's try it one more time. There we go. All right, on with the show. So, presenting the host of Command Line Heroes, Saran Yikbarak. Brendan Ike was 34 years old when he sat down at his desk in Netscape's headquarters. He was about to commit himself to a massive 10-day sprint of coding, to code a new language, a whole new programming language, in just 10 days. It was 1995, and the world of programming languages was about to change forever. I'm Saran Yadbarak, and this is Command Line Heroes, an original podcast from Red Hat, live from Amsterdam. This podcast season, we've been exploring the power and promise of programming languages, how our languages shape our world of development, and how they supercharge our work. In this episode, we're tracking the creation of JavaScript. Maybe you've heard the story of Brendan Eich before, but how does something like JavaScript really get created? Sure, there was Brendan's sprint, but there's so much more to the story. Our tale begins in the midst of a war, a browser war. The browser wars of the 1990s may seem like history, but they were hugely consequential. On one side of the battlefield, Netscape, they had formed an alliance with Sun Microsystems. On the other side, you've got Microsoft, software behemoth. And the spoils they were fighting over? It was a battle to decide who would be the gatekeeper of the internet. The stakes were huge. The fight was over who was going to be the main portal to going online. You have to realize that in, you know, in the early 90s, no one was really online very much. That's tech historian and author Clive Thompson. Netscape realized the power, the browser, was this key piece of software that people could use to get online and look at the web. So in late 1994, they offered a direct on-ramp, and suddenly... Thousands and millions of people are able to use the internet in this kind of graphical way. They're just getting massive, massive downloads and huge amounts of press. And everyone's basically saying, yeah, Netscape is kind of the future of this thing called the internet. But Microsoft? Well, their whole business model was packaging stuff inside Windows. They weren't really interested in browsers. Until they were. Microsoft stuck their head out of the sand a year later and saw that the world was moving online. But there was nothing inside of Microsoft Windows that could help them get there. All of a sudden, Microsoft's industry-wide dominance doesn't look so solid. And it's in that moment that the browser wars begin. The moment when Microsoft wakes up to the power of the internet and squints its eye at their new competition. And there was a strong sense of first mover advantage that uh, the first company that could sort of brand themselves as the way you get online would be the winner for years and years and maybe forever. I remember how rapid the pace of development was. I mean, Netscape was putting out a new browser every couple of months. Microsoft was accustomed to developing very slowly. To really understand how the browser wars went down, let's invite Jeremy Keith to the stage. Jeremy is the founder of ClearLeft a design studio in Brighton, England. He's also the author of what he likes to call are some books on web stuff. Come and join us, Jeremy. Welcome to the show. Thank you for having me. Okay, let's set the scene. I'm a developer. The web browser just came along. What was that like? 
Well, initially when the web came along, the appeal to developers, programmers, we would have called them back then, was in making web browsers. Like when Tim Berners-Lee released the code for the web, everyone was having a go making web browsers. There was as many web browsers as there were websites in the, in the early days. Uh, and Mosaic was the one that kind of really led the way. That was Mark Andreessen created that, and that went on to become Netscape. And suddenly there was an appeal not just to uh, developers, as we say now, or programmers, but to anyone, that you could put something on the internet and anyone could access it, whether you were an artist or a writer, no matter what you could be heard. Tell me more about that appeal. What was so appealing about it? Well, the barrier to entry was relatively low. You, yes, you had to learn this HTML stuff, but if you could learn that, then the access was, was there. Mm -hmm. I mean, you, you did have to have a computer, you did have to have a modem, you had to be able to get online, but it wasn't like you needed to know computer science in order to uh, put something out there onto the web. So Microsoft came onto the scene about a year later, right? So what was it about the browser that made Microsoft say, we need to compete? Well, Microsoft's history was in selling software, distributing software, and that used to be, you know, CD-ROMs that you'd buy in a shop. Um, but I think they started to realize that the potential future was that people would get their software online. And if their business was selling software, they needed to get in on that. Bill Gates famously wrote a memo effectively saying they'd been asleep at the wheel. And then they were in this really interesting situation of having to compete with Netscape, who were, their main product was free. They didn't even sell Netscape Navigator. So here you have Microsoft, who've made their money selling software, uh, putting all this effort into creating a piece of software that was going to be distributed for free. Mm -hmm. So we know that Microsoft's approach to building a browser is very different from, um, from Netscape's approach. So what was that difference like? Tell me about that. Well, to be honest, a lot of the differences seem to be just pure spitefulness, like let's do things differently just because they're different. So, you know, one browser would come up with an, a new HTML element, they'd make something up in order to do something on the web, and the other browser would come up with a completely different HTML element that would do the exact same thing just in order to have this uh, competition, it seemed like they almost wanted to force developers to choose which browser will you support, mm -hmm. rather than developers being in a position to be able to support both browsers. Well, thank you so much for your insights. You're gonna sit tight and we're gonna get back to you a little bit later, but for now we're gonna get back to our story. All that heat around the potential of life in a browser had made one thing very clear. We needed a new programming language, something that went far beyond HTML. We needed a language tailor-made for all that new web-based development. We wanted a language that didn't just survive online, but thrived there. In a way, Netscape was always the underdog in that battle. But here's the thing. Before the battle was over, they threw a beautiful Hail Mary. This would become an incredible win for the whole world of programming. So around the time that Microsoft decided to throw their hat in the ring, Netscape took a closer look at Java. Was Java going to be the language for web development? Java was this rich language. It performed just as well as C++, but it did still need to be compiled. Developers wanted something more lightweight, something that could be interpreted instead of compiled, something that would appeal to all those new programmers that were swarming to the web. Netscape wanted the programming language to bring static web pages to life. Their dream to work directly on the web. Wouldn't it be great, they thought, if they could release a new lightweight language that could run inside of the browser. And wouldn't it be great if it worked right at the same time they released Beta 2.0? There was only one hitch. That gave them exactly 10 days to create a new language. Actually, it gave one guy, Brendan Ike, 10 days. He was the one tasked with pulling this off. But there was no doubt that if anybody could do it, he could. 
That's because Brendan liked to create new languages for fun, just to play around with syntax. The key to Brendan Eich is that Brendan Eich, when he built JavaScript, had become sort of a, a language junkie. That's Charles Severance, a professor at the University of Michigan School of Information. JavaScript was sort of created in an environment where Java was seen as the future. And so in 1994, we thought that it was the thing that was going to solve everything. <laughs> One year later, the thing that would actually solve everything was about to appear, but it couldn't say, hey, I've solved everything because everybody myself included, believed in 94, 95 that we had seen the future of rock and roll, and it was the Java programming language. They had to build a language that seemed irrelevant, seemed silly, seemed meaningless, and yet was the right solution. On November 30th, 1995, Netscape released this powerful little seed of a language inside of Navigator 2.0. Soon, 28 companies agreed to use it as an open standard language. Companies like AOL and AT&T. But a lot of old pros looked down their noses at JavaScript. They thought it was just a language for newbies, a toy language. They missed its revolutionary potential. Brendan decided he would sneak in all these super advanced concepts from languages that are not well known, that were very like advanced object oriented languages. And so, so JavaScript is almost like a Trojan horse. It sort of sneaked into our collective consciousness with the idea that it was silly and fun and easy and lightweight, but then built in from almost the very beginning was a powerful, deeply thought, well thought out programming language that's capable of doing literally almost anything in computer science. But what Ike delivered was no toy language. It was sophisticated in hidden ways. It drew inspiration from languages that came before it. If you look at the basic syntax, it's very clear that it's inspired by the C language with its curly braces and semicolons. Some of the string patterns were taken from the Java programming language, but the object-oriented underlying patterns taken from a programming language called Modula 2, which had this notion of first-class functions, which to me is really the, the one of the most amazing choices that made JavaScript such a powerful and extensible language, and that is that the body of the function, the code that makes up a function itself, is also data. And the other thing that really was a part of the inspiration was HyperCard. JavaScript was always running in a browser, which meant it had a basic data context of the document object model, which is an object-oriented representation of a web page. It is not like a traditional programming language. The JavaScript code didn't start at the beginning. The first thing that it was was a web page. And so it ended up with this event-oriented programming. The result was a language native to the browser. It could evolve as our online lives evolved. It didn't take long before JavaScript became the de facto option for web development. JavaScript was a language that I had no choice to, but to learn. And literally, people that learn JavaScript usually have no choice because they're like, I want to build a browser application and I want it to have interactive elements. And the answer is, therefore, you must learn JavaScript. If you imagine, like, what is your favorite language, the answer to that question is almost got to be X plus JavaScript, <laughs> right? Someone might say, I like Python and JavaScript, or I like Scala and JavaScript because it's the one language everyone is required to learn. Netscape came out the gate incredibly strong, and they fought hard during the browser wars. But in the end, Netscape Navigator disappeared as a serious product. Microsoft was just too dominant. Windows was the default software package on 80 to 90% of computers on the planet. Explorer got bundled into all of that. Despite being a year late to the browser game, the all-powerful Microsoft won the day. Yet Netscape's Hail Mary, the creation of JavaScript, was a success. Because long after the fight was over, this language would have an afterlife that changed everything. Let's say you're relatively new to web development. 
you might take for granted that you can develop interactive web pages that can change and update. And you don't need to pull a whole new copy of the page from the server. And imagine for a second what it was like before you could do that, when doing that was brand new. Michael Clayton is a software engineer at Red Hat. We asked him to help us understand what a huge shift that was. In, I want to say 2004, Google Mail was released, Gmail. And it was, to my knowledge, the first web application that really took JavaScript to the next level, that used it to dynamically switch content out that you were looking at. Say you're looking at your inbox and you click on an email. In the old days, your email viewer would load a whole new page in your browser just to show you the email. Then you close that email and it would reload the whole inbox. It created a lot of latency. There was a lot of waiting when you would switch back and forth between views and Gmail changed all that. They used JavaScript to, in the background, fetch the content that you wanted to view and just put it in front of you without you having to wait for a brand new page view. Imagine how much time and energy you saved. But it changed more than just the speed. It changed the very nature of our work. So web developer as a job title has gone from being a server side kind of behind the scenes role to being just a very thin layer away from the user since they're writing code directly in the browser that the user is viewing the web page through. JavaScript pretty much ushered in the web 2.0 revolution. Anyone with a web browser suddenly had a development environment right in front of them. But, as I mentioned before, the old guard wasn't having any of it. They didn't like how things were getting so democratic. That early antagonism of JavaScript, uh, I was part of that myself. I had the browser extensions that would prevent JavaScript from running. I thought it was a useless toy language, and I kind of had this feeling of anger whenever I went to a web page that had JavaScript required for some critical feature of the site. I was like, you should build your website the right way without JavaScript. Soon enough, though, the potential that Brendan Eich built into his 10-day language became obvious to everyone, and now, it's conquering not just the browser, but the server too. With Node.js, a whole new territory for that little language that could, opened up. First in the browser, and then on servers. JavaScript was this unpretentious, secretly elegant, sometimes buggy language. A survivor from the browser wars that everybody underestimated. JavaScript has been kind of a Cinderella story of programming languages, starting in that early state of being essentially whipped together in 10 days, going through a lot of derision from the rest of the programming community, and still somehow continuing to find success and growth. JavaScript is essentially everywhere. The ability to run inside of a web page meant that JavaScript was as pervasive as the web is, which is quite pervasive. The more you look at the way JavaScript runs today, the more you realize it's got its fingers in every part of our online life. JavaScript rode the coattails of the web to a kind of language domination. And with any kind of domination, it got big and bloated. It became something that powered entire applications even before you wanted it to. Nuisance things like pop-up ads and tracking. JavaScript became all-consuming. The language famous for being so lightweight now takes up a lot of space and energy. And for that, let's talk to Jeremy. Hi, Jeremy. Hi, Saron. So I think that we can agree that JavaScript has basically eaten the world. How do you feel about this? On the one hand, it is a very feel-good Cinderella story, 
but on the others, Cinderella may have morphed into a wicked stepmother that has now crushed other languages in the browser under its heel, like HTML and CSS, which are great at what they do, just as JavaScript is good at what it does. But um, yeah, it seems like a lot of developers are treating JavaScript as the hammer and everything looks like a nail. Mm -hmm. So JavaScript is a tool, maybe, maybe a hammer, um, but we have many tools in our toolbox. Where does JavaScript sit in that toolbox? Well, like I say, I think I see it as part of this um, three-layered approach to building on the web. You have HTML for the content and the structure, CSS for the styling, and JavaScript for the behavior. But JavaScript is so powerful that if you want, you can use it to create you know, a document object model effectively uh, not needing any HTML. You can write styles in JavaScript effectively not needing any CSS. So if you want, you can just use JavaScript to do everything. But should you? Mm. So you mentioned HTML and CSS. Are there other programming languages that we should think about when it comes to the web? Well, when it comes to programming in the web browser, no. JavaScript is it. You kind of don't have a choice. Um, there have been some attempts to try and create alternatives to JavaScript in the web browser that never really worked out. However, you still have your web server, and you can use anything you want there. You can even use JavaScript there now, which is great, but uh, it's up to you. If you want Ruby, Python, Perl, whatever you want, you can put a lot of the computation back on the server and do things with pretty much any language there. So in an earlier episode, we talked about Perl and how Perl has grown, evolved, and at this point, kind of settled. When you think about the growth and evolution of JavaScript, where are we? Has it matured? Has it still got a lot to grow? What are your thoughts? It's almost the opposite story with JavaScript because it began kind of knowing its place, which was in the web browser. It was specifically for interacting with web pages. But since then, it's gone on to these new territories like servers, and we get things like Node. Uh, and it's spreading, and it, you can be found in more and more places. And along with that, it, it has grown, yes, this uh, evolution of the language itself. It gets more and more powerful features, which on one hand is great. The people who used to look down their nose at this toy language would now acknowledge maybe that it's got more powerful features, but it kind of comes at a cost, which, you know, that lower barrier to entry that came with the simpler toy language, um, that, that barrier to entry has been raised, I think, now, which is a bit of a shame. Mm. So not that long ago, you could block JavaScript when you're using the browser, and it wasn't a big deal. Maybe it'd be you know, a little inconvenient, but it was no big deal. Nowadays, it feels like if you try and block JavaScript, you're going to have a tough time. So it feels like we're very dependent on JavaScript when it comes to using the web. Is that a bad thing? Uh, frankly, yes. Uh, it's... There's a lot of things JavaScript is being used for that you need to use JavaScript for. Okay, fine, the more you know, heavy application-like things, sure. But JavaScript is also being used to do things that really you could use HTML for, just mm -hmm. rendering some text on a screen. And some people have experimented with switching off JavaScript today and browsing the web and documenting their findings. And surprisingly, there are some things that you, you still can do. You know, the websites that really pay attention to resilience um, will make sure that you can at least accomplish the core functionality without JavaScript, which is quite heartening. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you so much, Jeremy. We've got one more question for you, so sit tight. We can thank JavaScript for Google Docs, for YouTube, for Netflix, and it's pushed along by a huge number of open source libraries. Slash Data's most recent estimate of the number of JavaScript developers in the world is 10.7 million. Over at GitHub, JavaScript has more pull requests than any other language. Power lies with a whole world of command line heroes helping JavaScript grow, like all of you out there. Jeremy, given all of that, when you think about the future, of the web and the future of JavaScript, what does that future look like? What do you hope for? Moderation is what I hope for. I think we've gone a bit crazy with JavaScript, and I would love to see people treat JavaScript as the powerful tool it is, but as part of a toolbox of other equally powerful languages like HTML and CSS. Thank you. It's worth taking a step back and remembering here. Just a couple decades ago, in 1995, Brendan Eich was sitting in a room, hammering out a new language. And today, that language permeates everything we do. 
It might sound a bit cliche to say that some new string of code is going to change the world, but it does happen. A command line hero marshals all of their love for languages into a 10 day sprint and the world's DNA is changed forever. Command Line Heroes is an original podcast from Red Hat. Tomorrow, we publish our last episode of the season, The Sea Change. It's all about sea. If you haven't subscribed yet, now's your chance. And we are hard at work producing season four right now. Thank you so much to our guest, Jeremy Keith. And our sound designer, Sean Cole. And all of you for joining us today. I'm Saran Yatbarak. Until next time, keep on coding.